couples here that need no introduction. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. And I'm gonna ask some hard questions. And I ask them to be open, honest, transparent, and vulnerable. So we all can heal, because none of us in this, perf uh, in this room are perfect. I have this saying that God created us out of the dust because he always knew we were going to be dusty. <laughs> so we're dusty, OK? No matter what you put on, how you dress it up, there's areas in your life that need improvement. And that's your mental health. And let me break down mental health for you. Simple definition of mental health is how you live, how you love, and how you laugh. That's your mental health. And so that's what we're gonna talk about, how you live, okay? How you show up in the marketplace, how you make your living, how you love, that's relationships, and not just romantic relationships or spousal relationships, but your family, your friends, things that you're connected to. And then lastly, how do you laugh? How do you enjoy life? Amen? Amen. All right, so we just gonna go ahead and get in it. Y'all ready? We could always count on Pastor Sarah, right? It's too late. Lock the doors. Lock the doors. It's too late. So I got some questions here for you. And I'm going to start off easy. We're going to ease them into it. She, she doesn't know she's ready. We're going to ease it. Can you tell us? I'm a newlywed. Well, am I, am I a newlywed? How long are you a newlywed? Just a year? OK. Two years? Two years. Well, I'm a newlywed, and, but I was married before. I was married for 18 years, and I didn't do everything right in that marriage. Amen? Amen. But God gave me a second chance. And I said, God, if you give me a second chance to be skinny, I won't mess. I mean, married. <laughs> I won't mess it up. That too, but we're talking about marriage right now. I said, if you give me a second chance, I won't mess it up. And he's a God of a second chance. And so I want to ask you, all of you, what are the top three things that makes your marriage work? Thinking about your history, but also thinking about your destiny, where you're going. What are the three things that make your marriage work? I'll start off by saying uh, that my favorite city is Vegas, so now I feel comfortable because I was, <laughs> I was nervous. I, my wife and I always say, and we can collab on this, we always say that we're not experts, we're just experienced. Because mm. I, I think that when you enter a relationship, um, because a person is the way they are, then you spend the rest of the relationship trying to change them into you. And, and the difference between the two of you is they are them and you are you. And so you don't enter a relationship uh, assuming the position of transposing a person to acquiesce to your thought processes or conflict resolution styles because one of me is enough in the world, but two of me in the same house um, is, is overkill. So He's not- looking for an offering. Yeah. <laughs> you, you give it? I agree. I mean, I think Communication is huge, um, which no one told me the first time around, because this is also uh, an, another chance for me. And no one told me how important communicating is, and it's on all aspects. One thing my husband did um, shortly after we got married is he sat down, and he has this, this notebook, and it's leather, and it just looks like business, right? So whenever this notebook comes out, I'm like, oh, God, here we go. I don't know what's about to happen. <laughs> So it's like this old school leather notebook. He brings it to the table and he says, what's our goal for the next month, the next three months, the next six months? And it went all the way to five years. I have never, ever, like in a relationship, in a partnership, ever sat down and done our goals that way. And it was, a, it was like an eye opener to me because I, I was raised in a household where my dad had the table conversation, we had family meetings. If me and my sister had an argument or anything, we were having a family meeting, and Keon did not. So I would wanna talk about everything, and Keon, in his mind, 
I say, babe, let's talk. He's like, oh God. You know, it was like a panic came over him. And I just want to talk everything out, but to set goals with him. And we have what we call a, a contract and a commitment to where we can always go back to that page and say, this is what we committed to. You know, even if it alters or changes, we talk about it. So I think communication, to answer your question, one of the things is communication for sure. And that gives accountability and stability which for women, stability is one of our needs. Absolutely. So thank you, Pastor Keon. Thank you. Way well, let me get a little more stability uh, is that we have to do it on Wednesday. <laughs> and, <laughs> hold on. Sarah, please don't do it. Don't do it, Sarah. We do it on Wednesday because I figure if she can't remember for a week, it might not be that important. So we do it on Wednesdays, and then we give each other 10 minutes of uninterrupted conversation. So she gets to go 10 minutes, I can't sigh, I can't breathe hard, I can't respond, I can't tell her what I think, and then the reverse is true, and then here is the kicker part. Then we have to ask the person's permission um, to respond to it, and you can say, I'm not in a position at this moment to respond to that effectively. Wow, wow, that is huge. I actually teach couples that. You have to ask permission because you drop something that may have been marinated in your spirit, but it's news to them. And they can't answer off the cuff and they need a minute or 10 to think about that. that that's amazing, that's amazing. Look at Sarah, so let me walk on over here. Let me walk on. Challenge. Let me, let me take a stroll. 10 minute Wednesdays, y'all. Giving, see, that's, see how the devil did it? All right, yeah, wow, what a powerful, <laughs> what a powerful tool you've given us. <laughs> 10 minutes uninterrupted talking, no sighing, no huffing, no eye rolling, wow. <laughs> wow. I can't control my facial expressions, so we would have to have like a wall in between us. Cause baby, one thing I'ma do is put it on my face. Luckily, I rarely have any reason to do that. Look at her, look at her. She putting on them faces right now. <laughs> so I think our three things that have helped me in us, I think I'm gonna say constantly striving to have a healthy relationship because I think the health of a relationship is on a scale, depending on what's happening in our worlds, what's happening in our lives. And I think much like maybe the stock market, when we look at it over time, we're like, oh, this has been healthy, but there are some moments where it does feel like, is this healthy? Are we moving in? a way that is conducive for both of us. But I will say my three things are space for ourselves. So space for yourself. That means that you are a person outside of this unit and taking the time to do the things that you enjoy, I think have been really helpful for us. He has his things, I have my things. Space to be a mess because if you come from traumatic experiences or you've been in codependency in the past, when a person is going through a bad day at work or something in their family system has come up, it's very easy to internalize that as like, what did I do? Is there something wrong with me? But trusting that if there's an issue in our relationship that he has the ability and I have the openness to hear it. And if he doesn't bring it up as something that's happened about us, then he has space to have a bad day and space to, you know, have things go wrong at work. So space to be yourself, space to be a mess, and space to grow because uh, we're constantly changing. As we're coming to stuff like this, we're being exposed. Our dreams are being uh, more defined and more distilled in who he was yesterday, who he was when we first met almost 10 years ago is not the same person that he is now. And so I have the ability and the desire to constantly get to know him. So space to be a mess, space to be yourself, and space to grow. All right, she came up with the Trinity. Look at God. 
Um, I think for me, I don't, I'll try to come up with three. Um, but we're like really friends. Like we, I, I think that, that marriage is a house. It's like a house and a house has a lot of different rooms in it. You know, it's got your living room where, where you're just chilling and, and you're out in public and so it's not so public in the sense of your house. Um, you have your bedroom. Hey. <laughs> um, you have your office, you have your backyard, you have whatever. And so I think what works for me is that I don't have to live in a particular room all the time. There are gonna be some seasons where, where romanticism is not gonna be high because we're focused on work or we've got something happening with our kids and to have a broad enough marriage where you can live in different spaces and it'd be okay because then that makes, if I'm living in the living room or up in my office or whatever, it makes the bedroom more exciting when we're in the bedroom. And so being broad enough to not make your marriage one thing uh, and to make certain that you marry somebody that you can have a whole bunch of rooms with. You know, we do business together, but we don't do business in the bedroom. Kinda. <laughs> but but you, you understand what I'm saying? It, it's, 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 yeah. Amen. <laughs> but, but it's, it's, it, it's me. Huh? Spit it out, Reverend, spit huh? it out, spit it out. I got my brother with me too. He gonna do, do you need a minute? Do you need a minute? But I'm okay now, I think. Okay. We got a good little break between now and, and the ladies. But 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 um, um so so a, 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 a broad house. Uh, sometimes we're in the friendship, but to make certain that the friendship room is 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 a full-time room. Like, so no matter what, we're gonna be friends. Like, this is my dog. Like, like we high five, we laugh, we, I mean, she's really my friend. But I, I think um, maybe because the house is big and there are multiple rooms, maybe that's, that's my three. That's my three. That's your three? Yeah, bedroom. Amen, amen. <laughs> it's holy, it's holy and undefiled. Yeah. Uh, but no, but I, I think that, 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 that's a big enough one to keep the conversation going. Yeah. And, and what I love is because I actually use that analogy when I'm doing premarital counseling. It's a house. Marriage is a house. Yeah. And you have different rooms. Yeah. So do, I, I'm hiring. You Come, know? On. No. Come on. <laughs> but marriage is a house and you have different rule, uh, rooms. And you have different rules for each house. And sometimes people can look at the people on stage and look at your social media and think everything is perfect for you and that you never have conflict, that you never, you know, are in the doghouse or anything like that. So dispel that, that myth. How do you handle conflict in your relationship? Yeah, so you talked about houses. We actually have these three frames. Because you... you <laughs> Listen, he makes everything a sermon. Y'all watch, watch, watch. <laughs> Right. Watch, watch. That's why I always let him go first. Usually right. I like to go first because mine don't be as good. That's right. I'm going to be like, we, we, we just make it happen. And then he going to come with, go, babe, go. go. Say it on, sister. Go. You got this. Oh, yeah, right yeah. on. Okay, okay. Right, you, got you got All this. Right. You got this. Go. So you want to do the frame? Nope. Go ahead. No, you got to do it with I got to do it with you. Yes. All right. So, right. so we, got, we got the A frame. You already know what it is, right? Yes. So I, the A frame. I know it. I know it. The A frame <laughs> is when you're so dependent on each other that if somebody loses their balance, somebody falls. Mm, and so, so, so A-frame relationships are unhealthy because if she moves, I'm a mess. And then we've got the H-frame relationship, which means that we still have connectivity, but we are one situation away from separation. Wow. Wow. But then we have our M-frame. The M stands for marriage. Now, she's on her feet, I'm on my feet, but try to get in between this. Well, we got a circle frame. I didn't like 
like that. I don't <laughs> like that. I didn't Wait. know we was cheerleading. That's at the other convention. I'm a bag off. So no I'm matter what your alphabet off. is, if you an M or an O, <laughs> you gotta make your marriage work. But I love that because you have two couples here and they use, but they're saying the same thing if you listen carefully. They're saying the same thing, but how they express it comes out differently. So when you're sitting here and you're listening, we don't want you to mimic them. We want you to take the principle and then apply it to your life and apply it to your marriage. Amen? Okay, and Sarah kind of answered this, but I, I want to ask, go a little deeper. How do you make time for you in the relationship? Because that's one of your spaces, is how do you make time for you in the relationship without losing connectivity to your, your mate? Go ahead, tea time. <laughs> she mentioned tea time. That, that, that's uh, Toure time. Um, I, I think that, first of all, it's the consciousness that if I don't get time just to me, to minister to me, then TNS time is not gonna be what it can be. And she's learning that because like when I used to, you know, fly somewhere or drive somewhere or whatever, she used to be a little, you know, a little like, really? You, you get to do that, you know? <laughs> but, but the version of me that she would get when I got back was so uh, elevated and so loving and so patient and so, you know what I mean, that she started sending me away, like, <laughs> don't you need just some tea time? <laughs> and um, so I, I think for me, it's, we have an agreement. Now, I can't, I mean, I was trying to take some tea time. Uh, don't do that? Okay, okay, sometimes well, she, she'll jump on the plane. I but, but, um, <laughs> But we have an agreement. Where are we going? Right. right. I feel a heavy we in my spirit on this one. But we give each other permission. So I'll say, and she'll do the same, and she gets her time. Um, but, you know, hey, listen, I'm feeling like I need these few days. And by the way, it is not a rejection of her. And, and this is really important because me saying I need some tea time is not me saying I need time away from Sarah. It actually has nothing to do with Sarah or the kids or anybody else, but it is me recognizing what my soul needs to be the healthiest version of Toure. But you can't get there unless there's communication because it will look like you're running away from your spouse or from your kids or from work. It's not that, I'm not running away from nothing. I'm running to a better and healthier version of myself. So there's communication prior to me leaving, prior to her leaving, and then there's an agreement. There's some times where I can't go. Okay, I have this need, but as we look at our family, as we look at our, our, our work landscape, um, whatever, we, whatever we might need in our, our sphere of influence, there's some times where I have to put it off. Or, you know, what Sarah will do, sometimes I'll go and then she'll go. So it's just the, the communication part is big. I'll tell you, so the first time that he said he needed some tea time. That was unfamiliar to me, like time to himself. <laughs> and um, I had to really work through that one because I've just been in bad relationships in the past and I'm like, let me roll up at this hotel. <laughs> let me risk it all, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, don't let me, you know. And um, then when I realized that that was just my old trauma coming up and that I was attributing his character to previous experiences, I had to learn to really grow and trust him and trust God. And, you know, so that was one thing. Then I started getting resentful, though, because I think as the facilitator of the kids, the facilitator of the house, I have this idea in my head that if I leave, this whole thing gonna fall apart. <laughs> and that's not true. Right. I did not create in my mind 
um, enough room for the house to fall apart and that being okay, for the kids to be off their schedule and that be okay, for him to not do things the way that I would do them and for that to be okay. But the idea that like he was going away getting some time when I was like burnt out, losing myself, it used to create a lot of resentment ultimately not just within me but in our marriage. So anytime he needs time away, now I'm thinking about all of the times where I need time away, am I making this look so easy? I wish somebody would just send me away instead of using my own words to advocate for my own needs. And so when uh, the first time that I did go away, it was really more out of like, I'm, I'm finna show you that when I'm gone, whoop de whoop de woo And, um, but then when I got there by myself, I'm like, whoa, I can do this without it being a punishment or retaliation for him being gone and it not change the dynamic of our relationship and I get an opportunity to get what I need too. And we're talking like two days at a hotel up the street. And sometimes I do have to call in extra reinforcements, right? Cause he not gonna lay edges. And if my girl's at school and their edges ain't lay, what kind of mother am I? You know what I mean? So like, <laughs> Sometimes I do call in reinforcement. Can somebody, you know, here's the DoorDash, here's what they order, here's the snack routine. Like I do have to help facilitate it, but the time for me to recalibrate, be by myself, not be bothered when I'm in the bathroom, walk around with my wig off, be crazy, eat food in the bed, watch ratchet television, then pray. This is how I know how to pray effectively, is when I see what's happening in the world. God, I bring my sister Nene to you. She's throwing drinks at people, you know? And um, I feel like a woman. And I think, let me just say this. I think part of what makes it difficult for women to feel sexy and to show up as women in their marriages is we are legitimately so tired thinking about tomorrow that the idea that I can throw it in a circle tonight is unreasonable. <laughs> well, but... I have found that when I disconnect from my responsibilities and I have a minute to recalibrate, that I, the circle still circulates. I think you, you, know? need, to, I think you need to go to Jamaica. <laughs> I, I just feel like the Lord's speaking to send me. Send me, Lord, send me. I just, just send me, forward. Lord. Wait, Don't wait, send oh. him over here. Send him over here too. <laughs> but let, let's talk about that for a minute because I think- They can go for, together. I think- <laughs> Today, I, I mean, they can easier. leave now. I see nothing wrong with it. I, now. I see. I think I it's see easier. <laughs> I see no, nothing they wrong just out of it. control. They just out of control. <laughs> but really, I think you hit on something, Pastor Sarah, is that I think for men and for fathers, it's easier to take the tea time and, and get away. I think society has placed on women that everything does hinge on us. And we are selfish if we take time away instead of it being self-care, is what you described. And so self-care is not selfishness, it's necessary. Because if you're the foundation and there's a crack in the foundation, guess what? Everything's gonna fall. So you gotta take care of the foundation. That's self-care and that's wisdom. Amen? And to, and to do it, and to do it, I'm sorry, and to do it without guilt. And to do it without yes. guilt, because when, when I did take that time, and I'm, I'm gonna pass it to Shani, but when I did take that, I used to feel guilty, like, you know, walking out the door, but then I realized it's not being selfish, it's being self-full. It's being, it's being mindful of self, and so um, you have to break that, that guilt spirit off so that you can go, listen, that's what I'm gonna say. When Jesus is asked what the greatest commandments were, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And then he says, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. We think that the sequence is God, neighbor, self. But it is not. It is God, self, neighbor. How, how you interact with your neighbor has everything to do with how do you interact with you. And so it's, it's loving yourself enough to make certain that you get what you need. And God says that's a great commandment because I am going to be a better husband. I am going to be a better uh, CEO. I am going to be a better pastor and leader if I love me first. Amen. Amen. So let's switch gears a little bit here. 
because you guys are so busy. Like, just looking at your schedules, looking at your social media, I get tired. <laughs> right? So how do you not let ministry or the marketplace overtake your relationships? <laughs> I, you know, oh. mine gonna be fast. It does, like it does overtake. And when it does overtake, we readjust our boundaries, we acknowledge it, and then we move it back over. But I do think we have moments where like, he's in boss mode, I'm focused on something else. And you know, we could start sending texts like, you know, like we gonna have a W-2 at the end of the year. Like, could you do X, Y, and Z? No, please, no thank you, no gratitude. And I think that when one of us waves a flag and we're like, wait a minute, that was a little too close to like employee, employer, or like pastoral, and you know, I'm your wife, I'm your partner. I think that we're able to readjust, but for us, it does bleed over. So I, cause I'm not gonna let anyone think that like, oh my gosh, we managed this perfectly. We just realized that when we've crossed that boundary that we should fix it because what's most important to us is the marriage. And you have to, amen. And you're getting good at, no, but you're getting good at, at saying something because um, I started a, a, another company uh, recently and it took, and you know, it takes when you're starting something new, it takes all of you, like everything. And I didn't realize, and I'm so glad you brought it up, it humbled me. And uh, I can't remember how you said it, but you were basically like, where, where are you? You know, where, where, where have you been? You've been so focused for the past six weeks. You've been so focused on this new company that, um, you know, I didn't even realize I was missing her because I just was doing what I do. And we, can, we, we get locked in those rhythms where we're just doing what we do. But it was you communicating to me that, um, that I wasn't present. And that helped me. That helped me a lot. Can I say, too, though, I think that what we had to learn is that me holding you accountable to our marriage or you holding me accountable to our marriage is not the same thing as me attacking your dream. Yeah. Because like, I'm not trying to stand in the way of your progress. I'm not trying to stand in the way of who you're called to be in the earth. Like, I want to see you win. I want to see you prosper. But I'm also want to know where we fit in that. I want to know that I'm on your mind in the process of all of those things. And I had to learn that. And I think that um, that helped me to receive then when you're telling me like, hey, you're off center, that I'm not now trying to be like, oh, you hating on me. You don't want to see me win. You, you know what I mean? We're on the same team. and. Um, we had to really establish trust in us being in the same team so that we could hold one another accountable to the level of balance that works for our marriage. And we've, we've tried to make sure that we add the third M. So you got the ministry, the marketplace, the marriage is also a business, right? So that we, we, we pour into it, we invest in it. Uh, we're, we're new at it, right? So uh, we don't have 10 years of experience with each other but we have um, many years of experience apart. And one of the things that we say to each other, there's a difference between having um, 10 years of experience and one year of experience 10 times. Mm. Right? Yeah, yeah. There's, yeah. There's, there's a difference because if you get repetitive in the cycle, you're gonna do the same thing this January that you did last January and you don't have experience, you have repetition. And so what we try to do, and, and this is the greatest thing about it, whereas Pastor uh, Sarah and Tere are, are in ministry together, I had a ministry when I met my wife. So what I've leaned on her to do is to help me to maintain the balance that she had and not let ministry swallow us both up. That's great. That's great. So she has the permission to grab me out of beast mode and say, we're going to Vegas for the next three days and you're gonna do nothing but play golf while I lay by the pool and that's just the way it's gonna be. And I understand what she's trying to do is save me from myself. Yeah, yes. She's trying to save me from myself. The other thing that we all four deal with is the unrealistic expectations. People treat us like barbers and beauticians. They wanna leave, but they want us in the chair when they need their hair done. I mean, just be honest, nobody wants their barber to be gone on the day that they show up, but we schedule ourselves in the schedule and somebody's edges just ain't gonna get laid that week because we out, we out, we gone. Yeah, I think 
my theme is intentional. Like everything I do, I try to be very intentional about. So again, we talk about these things and I had to point out to him one time, I said, why is it every time we go to the office on the drive over, you turn into somebody else? He would like turn into like this CEO, even with me, like in the car. He didn't realize he was doing it though. And it took like a few times and I was like, you know, every time we go to the office, like you have this, you turn just into somebody else. And he had to, he had to see that in himself. But I'm like, at some point, like you gotta just let that, it's so much on y'all being pastors, like it's so heavy. And I, I just had to keep having that conversation because again, being on this side of ministry is new to me. So sometimes I sit back and be like, why you just don't tell them no? You know, like, it's midnight. You can't know, you know, but y'all can't do that. I mean, you can, but they can't. <laughs> they can't. They the should, Lord. but Praise they the can't. Lord. But I, I feel like I can. I'll be like, give me the phone. I'll be like, no. But I... I <laughs> They'll forgive me. I tell them all the time, just blame me. They think I don't know nothing anyway, so I don't know. Blame me she don't know church etiquette or something. I don't know. Tell them something. But um. that leads into my next question. Yeah. Because you're not the traditional first lady. And Sarah, Pastor Sarah, you're not the traditional pastor, female pastor. Right. Look at how she gave me the look, y'all. She gave me the look. <laughs> But you guys are breaking stereotypes. Because we can get real churchy and we can put ourselves in the place of God and think we know who deserves what. So listen, he said preach. No, y'all missed that last night, preach. But this is the thing, I love that about you too. I love that you embrace who you are and not the traditional mode of first lady or pastor. And I think that's why people are attracted to you because you give them the courage to be themselves. And in particular, I'm just getting to know first lady Henderson, but I've been able to watch Sarah. And I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep saying past Sarah because I've called her Sarah for so many years. But Pastor Sarah, I've gotten to see the transition. And one of the things I love is that you kept being you. Even as you elevated, you kept being you. And I love you for that. And so talk about that. How did you maintain that? How do you maintain that being you when you have so much pressure to be something else? Or it could be easy to be what somebody else expects. Yeah, I'm gonna go first because Sarah's is about to be really good. Um, <laughs> sorry, Pastor Sarah, I gotta say this. Um, <laughs> I, I just, I don't know how to be anything but. And it's interesting now, I realize at this point in life that even though I did TV since 2010, people don't really know me. You know, I did not share who I was and how I was molded into the person that I am now. So, you know, everything somebody thinks is pretty much just a perspective of a few minutes of, of TV time. Um, so I think that this space in my life, Bishop said something the other night where he said, I can respectfully tell people to just go to hell. Um, that he said it, not me, he said it. I'm just repeating what the bishop said, but that is in my spirit. But I... Um, you felt that in your shanana. <laughs> and I love people. I had this conversation with Sarah, and I was like, I love people. Like, I, I, I'm a hugger, and I, I really do love people, but I have this thing where I do keep this little bit of a shield around me, and it's just a protective space because of things that I've been through and seen and the trauma I bring. And we, it, I can't even go back to what Pastor Teray was saying about letting go of guilt. I have not been able to do that. Like I've, I was a single mom for so long that it was me and my five kids and I did everything. I, it was just me. And I still, my youngest is 17 and she's home with us, but I still feel guilty 
leaving and, and not being there for everything because I was there everything for so long. So I'm working on that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not there yet. But as far as like the perspective and the expectations that people have of what a first lady is, I, I asked him, I said, what, what is the biblical translation of a first lady? Because it isn't one. It, I mean, it isn't one that I found. Maybe I'm wrong, I ain't a pastor, so I don't know. Um, but I don't think, I don't even love the title. You know, like I don't, I don't require people to say lady, I just, y'all can call me Shawnee, it's fine. But I think that I just don't try to meet any expectations and remain who I am because that's the real and people, will gravitate to real. I'm only gonna gravitate to what I feel is real. And what I feel, if I feel you believe what you are saying to me, and you believe what, you know, what, what you're trying to make me, but I can, I can draw into that. Otherwise, you know, fake, we see the fake. And, and I can't, I just can't. So say the good stuff, Sarah, cause you're about to say some real good, real good stuff. I don't, yeah, what you said was amazing. I don't know that I, can fully answer this without just like, just going on and on and on. But I didn't really expect to be in ministry. Um, I stumbled into it. I've been really open about that. It's not like I felt like since I was a little girl, I was called to preach to the world. Yeah. And that's some people's testimony. I just, I never felt that way. And um, I think that when I started blogging and people started connecting to the blog, and it kind of became something that felt like it was bigger than me that I just made a commitment to like hang on to myself. Um, just because I've been in a ministry family for so long that I've seen people literally overdose trying to live up to expectations. And people end up with addictions and you know, just all of the numbers, numbers of things that happen when you're in this platform. And so um, my ministry and my desire centers around what would have been effective in getting my attention um, in the moments where I was completely lost and just the church phrases just weren't translating to me. Um, what would I have wanted to know about how hard it is to walk certain things out and how can I give language to that? And I think ultimately I have a commitment to like really hang on to myself. I think like, you know, one of the many blessings that God has revealed in me getting pregnant at such an early age is that like, you know, for the most part, like graduating from high school is like the greatest achievement. Cause like, you know, you get pregnant at 13, nobody's really rooting on you doing anything great. And so I think the bar was so low that you're like, y'all really got me out here. And I just feel like, I, no, it's not that I can't lose, but I'm just like, I am so much further out than I think anyone ever thought that I would be. So I don't feel a sense of failure because even if I like fail from here, I still came way further than I ever thought I could be. So like, it's just up and it's stuck. Come on now, Woo! it's just up, it's just up. Wow, thank you. Thank you both for sharing that because I think especially for a lot of women, um, and especially if you're married to a pastor, you get burnt out on expectations and trying to fill everybody's expectations. So you two just gave them permission to be free. I will say this, so PT was pastoring before um, he and I met and got married. And one of the things that he did tell me was like, if you don't wanna do like the whole pastor's wife thing, like that's cool, or you wanna do it your way, like nothing that's ever been seen before, like that's cool too. And so I do think in relationships where there is pressure from church and local communities for you to like live up to whatever this first lady role is supposed to be, that ultimately you and your partner hold the vision for that church. God's given you all the vision for that church. And I think the husband plays an incredible role in giving the wife space to be who she is, no matter 
matter who that is, and to defend her from people in the church who say she needs to be a certain that part, way. Yeah. That because, part, yeah. you know, like, I'm here to help undergird what God is doing in his life, not even just in this building, because I know who he is outside of the building. Like, I'm here to undergird all of who he is. Right. And I think, you know, the least that he can do as a form of reciprocity is undergird the process that she's still in, and she's finding her purpose and finding her voice and creating space for her to do that. And to PT's point, when we first started dating, he said that he knew that God told him that his role in my life was to create an environment for me to flourish. And he was true to that and authentic to that and has been protective and edifying over my process. And he didn't allow anybody, not even myself, to put negative labels or stigmas on me. So I think that that unit, if that unit is tight, it'll give her space to really be whoever she's supposed to be and not what people say she's supposed to do. Amen. Yeah. That I'd, so I'd echo good. that yes. as well. Go Keon ahead. is the same way with me. He does not play about me, and he protects me. And he was very open in saying when we first got married, the same thing. He was like, listen, you do this first lady or don't do this first lady thing how you want to do it. Yeah. Um, and, and you figure it out. You take the time. Actually, Lady Sarita told me, never even try to attempt to meet the expectations. Because once you try, it'll never be enough. And they'll keep expecting something else and something new. And so don't give them any. And I've been priding myself on that. But Keon has been very, very supportive and always had my back in that space. And so to what Sarah was saying, I think that's also extremely important, especially in ministry, because it ain't easy. <laughs> I, I tell them sometimes, I said, sometimes I'll get up there and people's faces are just like. Can I, I ask you a question? So, you know, PT used to have a powerful prayer ministry too before we got married where people would be in need in the, in the late night hours. <laughs> Some of the some of the some of the women's of God. Of course, some, some of the single of single course. available women. Some of the huh. single women's needed of prayer. God. Why, why is it always at midnight? They, they, they needed late night prayer. Yeah. And then for some reason, when I came into the picture, I don't know. Maybe I'm a miracle worker. I don't know. <laughs> I like there was a healing that took place. They no longer yeah. needed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They no longer needed those yeah. prayers. He'll deliver you if yeah. you let him. Okay. So he, there was a deliverance. Yes. So like, oh, this is not my panel, but I'm asking question. So like, <laughs> how did you overcome the women's who wanted to, a touch of the hem of his garment? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. They still in some yeah, of the, they still, still in there, some yeah. of the churches yeah. still I even I think me and PT going to Jamaica. Come yeah, on, that's how, that's it. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> no, like, cause like, cause like. It done got hot. I mean, it done got hot up here. You know, my parents been married 40 years and right. it's still some touching of the right. hymns of the garment yeah. 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 that they want to touch on. Yeah. And so like, how do you all, <laughs> how do you all, <laughs> you know, without making us feel like we crazy, we jealous. Right. Like when we say she's sniffing, and I got some for like how do you navigate how? the reality how? How? of like <laughs> you know this real no uh, listen listen uh, if, if, if we need answers my, my work. No. we need answers my we work. need answers my work. no for real no for real how? cause like sometimes sometimes God's still working on people right. And we know that you see the best of them because y'all pastors That's and so we good. pastors and we see the best of them. But like, how do we draw those boundaries so that everyone can stay saved and not in trouble? You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Not in handcuffs. And, and can I add something to that? Let's not just say pastors. Let us say CEOs and yeah. business right. owners. Right. How, how yeah. do we do that? How, how do we draw clear boundaries? And so... Uh, <laughs> what had happened was... <laughs> Look at all the cameras looking no, there. <laughs> no, I think, so first of all, I, I, I trust your instincts. Amen. Because I'll be honest, like, when, when Sarah and I first got married, uh -huh. she was clocking 
like all of the ladies in the community. And at first I was like, you, 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 you overboard. That's, no, nah, you know, she, she covering me. And it's, you know, but she was right. Covering. She was right. And then they started, no, no, they started leaving. Like they started like leaving. I didn't know. So, so, so in all honesty, like, I think like, like for real, for real, like when your heart is pure, you expect other people's hearts to be pure and their motives to be pure. Mm. And so. And God sent you a purifier. So. <laughs> God sent you a purifier, honey. It's running through her. So I had to start believing her. I had to start like, it, you, you're picking up on something. You're a woman. You're picking up on something that that I can't see. I can't. I can't. I can't. Um, I can't pick up. So I. So I, I trusted you, and so uh, and I still do that to, the, to this day. But but there are two sides to that coin. Well. Well. Now. All right. Now. All right. All right. Come Wait on. a now. minute. All right. Now. There are two sides. Do you see? This woman? Because now I got more deacons now than now, I've ever let's had. Go. Let's go. Now let's go. They want to volunteer. Listen. Now they, now they call. Like Listen. the men's ministry that Keon, up. These, look, these Negroes, these Negroes with all of a sudden they got prophecy for my wife. C -c -c Come here. Come <laughs> I'm all the prophets you need. Prophecy. Okay. Uh, uh, the Lord, the Lord, uh, Pastor Sarah, I, I okay, just. Okay, let's, uh, let's address that. Let's address that because it is. We got deacons. We got deacons that want to uh, lay hands and, and, <laughs> and different things. So how do you address that as and women? Hold on. And I, as I, I got to get women. in there. I got to get in there. Come on. Come on. Because it don't just be the people at our church. It be the pastors at other churches. Yeah. Oh, no. Hey, beautiful. No. That's no. the Bible. You told Jeremiah. No I go. <laughs> me. We got to go back to church because we... We yeah, to. we gotta bring it back. Okay, we back. We back. We, we back. back. Are y'all back? Y'all good? I told you it was gonna get it. I told you it was gonna get real. I told you it was gonna be honest. Okay, so I will say to land the plane, what we have learned to do, because that does, it does happen. People, this, what? In both, in both directions. Get out. It does. What we have done as a rule in our relationship whether we see it or not, we trust the other person's perspective. Because yeah. it doesn't matter whether we see it or not, if there's anything in our relationship that could even be a potential for threat, or a potential for division, or a potential for insecurity, I'm not gonna ask you to change the way you think, I'ma just move in a different direction yeah. so that this doesn't have to be anything that we yeah. worry about. It ain't worth it. That's good. It ain't worth it. That's good. I, I always tell my wife, I swear to you, we say it all the time. I'd be like, she'll say, well, how do you handle it? I promise you, I, my response is always the same. Discipline is far cheaper than regret. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. cost of discipline is far cheaper than regret. And I know what type of regret I would have. Oh, God. If this woman is absent in my life. Oh, God. So that regret is my boundary. That's wonderful. I could not handle that regret. That's wonderful. And that's my boundary. And that comes, listen, that doesn't come from sanctification. It comes from experience. Say that. It ain't, cause, it ain't because that. I got the whole Bible memorized. It's because I know what regret feels like. Yeah. And it is a cost too painful to bear. The reason this woman is sitting on my left now is not because she's beautiful, because I think she's beautiful, and not because she's smart and I think she's intelligent. I remember when I got a divorce and I thought I would never be in front of a room like this again. And I laid in my bed depressed about what I thought the church was going to do to me, and she rubbed my head until it start, my hair started to grow back. <laughs> until I felt strength again. Until I felt like, if I just have the audience of one. Yeah. It's better than the audience of thousands. And I never will forget, her dad counseled us 
And I was low on myself because I was the pastor that went through divorce and da 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 so I was low on myself. And he said something that snapped me out of it. He looked at her, everybody know who her husband used to be. He said, now this is my son. And he said, I don't want to see him go through hurt anymore. And he looked at her and said, and don't forget, he's shacking his world. I said, you, <laughs> you're right, you're right. I have forgot. I forgot. Because you got to have somebody outside of you to remind you about who you were before you went down. And I heard his language in her. And when we did counseling, your dad will tell you this, we were up there for six hours and five of it was them talking. It was them talking. And, they, and, and her father was dying, and he was translating to her what her father meant yeah. when he was trying to get closer to her. He, he looked at her and said, your dad's leaving. Yeah. See, th those kinds of things brought us together. Yes. Those kinds of things made me feel like I can trust this woman, because you ain't never heard about it, about the shape I was in when she met me, and you won't hear about it, because this is my dog, yeah. right? And so that's, that's, that's why I feel it. Yeah. We have a bond, and that, that regret of losing that, because I never had it. I never had it. And losing that is too big of a cost for me. Listen, I feel you. I told my husband, I said, they will never say I'm divorced again. They'll say never. I'm a widow. Never. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I yeah, will yeah. be a widow, and let, let me put it on record. I love that man. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Because of what I went through. I love that man, and I will be a widow. I will never be divorced. I ain't going nowhere. You can't get rid of me. I love, that's my, that's my kind of energy. Because yeah. if something ever happened to me, and y'all see him posted up with something, don't y'all leave no comments talking about, like, she would have wanted this for you. No, she wouldn't have. <laughs> be, be no, lonely. she wouldn't have. Be lonely. She wouldn't have. Now, you know Seraph and Nahan, both of y'all. <laughs> don't you bet, won't be no rest man, in peace. Man, look, look, I do this thing by myself. I'm good. I'm serious. I'm serious. By myself. You better miss me every day I'm gone. Every day. Every day. You think... Hey. Listen, I saw your post. You said he ain't been hungry since. Ain't been hungry since. Listen. Well, this has been fun. This has been open. This has been honest. I want to thank my guests for your transparency. Your openness, your honesty. Thank you so much. Love you. Thank you so much.